mentioned earlier, um, we have been so lucky that uh, Dr. Joseph Riggio has uh, been kind enough to spend a little more time um, with us today than he uh, initially planned for. Um, he is uh, from uh, he's from uh, the USA. He has uh, been working internationally with the some of the the biggest company in the world, the top uh, Fortune um, 500. And he has worked with these companies to uh, how do we achieve the, the best possible outcomes uh, and how do we create top performance. And I'm, I'm not meaning like top, I mean top performance. Um, and um, I think I will let him introduce uh, himself into how he has been working with these companies uh, to create these performances. Um, and he's a cognitive scientist and uh, he has been working with this for more than three decades. Um, helping individuals as well uh, as organizations to achieve these breakthroughs. And then he's the author, author of several books. Without further ado, uh, please welcome Dr. Joseph Brigio. Thank you, thank you. Can you hear me? Is this on? Okay. So there's a picture behind me for a moment, or there wasn't behind me actually, it was behind where I'm standing. And uh, in that picture I had hair but I decided to, I heard this was sexier, so I did it. <laughs> if uh, any of you feel the urge and compulsive need to rush forward, control yourselves. <laughs> Male or female, control yourselves. <laughs> so, um, I, I've been doing this for three decades. It was like a little terrifying to hear those words come out of somebody's mouth, actually. Um, which probably has something to do with the fact that I'm now shaving my head. Um, and in three decades, what I can tell you is that you begin to experience a lot of different things and then recognize a lot of things that you experience which are different aren't. They're just patterns of the same thing played out in different ways. So what I want to talk to you about is I want to talk to you more about what's relevant to you and where we can go with this idea of what I call the resonant signature. Resonant being something that vibrates in a common way. So when you play an instrument, if you hit a particular note on an instrument, a note that's resonant to it will vibrate a bit as well, and you get what's called harmonies, right? So overtones. And when you play two notes that are properly related to one another, a third note will always be heard, and that's really where the harmony emerges, is that these ideas of common vibratory patterns or frequencies initiate <coughs> additional frequencies that complement, these overtones are complementary, right? And this is harmony. The opposite of harmony is dissonance, where tones or frequencies cancel out at one another. So I'm talking about this idea of organizations and individuals, by the way, having what I call a resonant signature, a complementary <laughs> way of interacting or operating or being at a fundamental level of beingness in the world that causes this harmonic pattern to occur a complementary pattern, something more than is present in the individuals who are present emerges because they are present in connection or interaction with one another. Does that make some sense as an idea? Right? So this is what I'm calling this resonant signature. And I'm going to address it in two ways. Rather than talk about myself and my history and all those things and take a lot of your time because we have a limited amount of time, um, you know, if you really need to know that, I'll be happy to share a biography with you at some point. But let's get, let's jump into it. Let's get there. So the idea here is this, that you personally, each one of you sitting in the room in front of me, I, we have a resonant signature. We have a way of being in the world which is so fundamental for us that when we operate that way, it's as though the fullness of our expression is immediately present. You could say a person who has this access to themselves in this way has a certain charisma. Right? They generate a sense of being that's felt, that's, a, that's acknowledgeable by others. There's no way to avoid that the person who has this way of being in the world, who, who is in line with themselves, they can't be avoided in the sense of you recognizing they're present. They are, in fact, present. There are other ways that people operate, and you've probably encountered this, where somebody's in an engagement with someone else, or is in a large group of people, or a party, or something of that nature, and it's as though they weren't there. Right? I love this phrase from James Joyce. He wrote this in The Dubliners. And he said, you know, Mr. Finnegan lived a short distance from his body. <laughs> you know, this is the opposite of what I'm talking about. It, it's the idea of 
fully embodying yourself and being incredibly present to who you are and to know what that is and to know how to access it. Now, in addition to that, let's call them groups, right? Groups of people have a resonant signature when, in fact, they come together and they show up as present in common form to one another. They're truly engaged in a way that they acknowledge and are available in a powerful way to one another. And again, because of that, something emerges. <laughs> and what's really interesting to me, I said I've been in this uh, business for quite a while, we've seen a lot more movement in organizational terms to ad hoc groups and teams. This is a, a very different thing. If you went back 30 years ago, it was far more common that things were organized and put in place at some central function or central planning function, right? So there was some person or maybe even a department or division of an organization that would go, this is how these people will work together and they will be the group of XYZ. Today, what happens is it's not uncommon for people to find themselves within an organization coming together and something begins to arise and build because there's a common interest. There's something that needs to get done. <coughs> there's some conversation that occurs that brings them together and now they become this ad hoc team, or this ad hoc group. Or maybe I go out into an organization and I'm responsible for getting something done and I go, hey, you and you and you and you and you, because I know that we'll work together, or I know you'll work together well, or maybe because we'll challenge one another, I'd like to bring you together and now we're going to be this team for this thing. <coughs> So there's this, this emergent form of team, this emergent form of group that occurs. Now, if that occurs that way, what's the signature of this group? What, what holds them in this common form together? Because part of what I want, if I'm a leader, is I want a certain degree of conflict. Now, I don't want conflict in the form of we're going to have animosity or anger we're not going to be upset with one another. But we might be upset with one another's ideas. You get that? And this takes a certain degree of maturity, which I've found a small percentage of the planet actually possesses. <laughs> the ability to distinguish disagreeing with me and disagreeing with my ideas. This subtle form requires a very high level of, we might even call it intellect. Right? But it's, a, it's more than that. There's a maturity that's involved here to do what I'm talking about, to access this resonance of a group. And the only way that I've ever seen it work, especially through time, because as these little offenses in, you know, begin to accumulate, where people engage with one another in a group, in a division, in a company, in an organization, in a society, on the planet, there's little offenses. I say something, right? Stephanie doesn't particularly like it, but she lets it go because it's you know, one little thing. We bumped against one another. It's okay. It happens 30 times, and now she's really upset, right? Because <coughs> if we weren't able to, to resolve these little individual offenses. Now, the question is, was it really an offense about me or about something I said or did? And can you distinguish, would she be able to, distinguish the dis that difference between this isn't who he is, this is not his being, this is something he said or did. Right? Now we could argue, and I would argue, that what I say and do emerges from who I am. So it's a reflection of who I am. But none of those things unto themselves can contain the totality of who I am. Does that make sense again as an idea? So this subtlety requires really being willing to be present and then to acknowledge the presence including those subtle offenses, right? So if I get offended by her ideas, then what I can't help but to do is because I am offended by her ideas, I am offended by her. That's the translation my brain makes. We're going to talk about neuroscience in a few moments. However, if I can go, I'm offended by that idea as an idea, but it's not necessarily who I think she is, I can let it go about her, and now we can begin to have a conversation about the idea. But only if she's willing to do the same thing. <laughs> only if she's not so identified with her ideas, that if anybody challenges her ideas, she feels challenged. <coughs> so can you do that? Can you hold yourself intact, as separate from and distinct from the ideas you possess, or the ideas that you possess today, 
as something you're committed to. Because I had ideas, you know, last week that I thought were the most important thing in the world that I've given up already, right? <laughs> okay. So I've, I've gotten to recognize, you know, one of the advantages of, you know, having to shave your head because you're too old to have all your hair is that you're old enough to recognize your ideas aren't who you are. The people that you identify with aren't who you are. That these things change over time. Who my daughter, at almost 18 now, is to me is different than who she was to me at three. My relationship with her is different than it was. No less significant, no less profound for me, or my son who's 31. But they've changed. And, and the question is, am I capable of being me and allowing those changes to happen? So am I capable, for instance, of allowing my daughter to be 18? Or must I hold her in my mind at 3 or 5 or 7 because there's my comfort level? <laughs> Can I make that distinction? Can I let her be a person? with her own resonance signature. Can I let Stephanie be a person with her own resonance signature? Can I acknowledge you as individuals as well as as a group? You understand what I mean now when I say it takes a certain degree of intellectual maturity, a certain degree of personal maturity, to be able to stand in your own space, not give that up, and allow others to have their space as well, as my partner likes to say, to recognize where your dance space begins and ends. So when we're dancing, we get really close to one another, but it's not much fun if I'm stepping on your toes. <laughs> so now we look at this and we say, okay, so how do I help if I'm in this leadership role, the group that I've brought together to be able to hold these spaces simultaneously? Right? F, F. Scott Fitzgerald, famous American author, said, genius is the ability to hold two paradoxical ideas in place simultaneously. So how do I hold this group together and simultaneously let every individual in the group be themselves? How do I acknowledge them as individuals but not let them run off as an individual apart from or separate from the group to bring themselves to it? And to some extent, and here's the great challenge, here's where especially in our modern age, you can say, we seem to run into a wall sometimes, is that we want to be unique. We want to express ourselves and to be individuals. We hear ideas like, everyone's entitled to an opinion. When I hear that, my question is always, why? Have you earned it? With me, you're not entitled to an opinion until you've earned that opinion. Have you lived enough to have an opinion? This is always my question for my children. <laughs> have all the opinions you want, as long as you keep them to yourself. As soon as you put it out here in public, now it's no longer just an opinion. Now it's an imposition. Do you have the right to impose upon me because you've lived enough to impose upon me? You know enough to impose upon me. You've developed enough expertise, awareness, sensitivity, consideration to impose upon me. And if you have, I'll let you. I'll even sublimate myself to you. I'll subordinate myself to you. In the area of the domain where you, sh you possess those things. I've met dozens, if not hundreds of people in my lifetime who possess that kind of position relative to the particular that we're interacting around, where it only makes sense if I'm sane to subordinate myself to them. When I go to an expert for an opinion, I subordinate myself to that expert's opinion in that area, not to them as a human being. Again, I can make this distinction between their ideas, their expertise, where they possess something I need, want, or desire, and I don't to allow myself to be subordinate to it. In my business, for instance, I hire advisors all the time, accountants, lawyers, consultants. It makes no sense for me to hire these people and not subordinate myself to their expertise if in fact I've checked and know that they have an expertise that they bring that's greater than mine in this area of what it is I've asked them to consult on, to bring their expertise to. Does that make sense? Does it make sense for me to ask to stay awake when I'm having a liver transplant so I can give the doctor a complimentary consideration. You know, we can, we can discuss it as he's doing it. I have an opinion about this. Again, you know, I came here to talk to you about a resident signature. I guess I'm talking to you more about 
the level of emotional maturity that we encounter in ourselves and in others. Our ability to suppress our opinions, to hold them to ourselves when we recognize that's all they are. They're not actually a reflection of any unique proposition. And here we are. Now I have to lead this team and I'm in an environment, a culture, a society which says each of these individuals needs to be respected and have a voice. They're entitled to be heard. And here I am, the fool from the United States going, why? Have they earned it? Why should I listen to them? Well, because they have a right. They're, they're, they're people just like you. Okay, are we having a conversation about the nature of being a human being and stepping on the world and are we talking about what we're going to have for dinner? Are we talking about something that requires specific, specialized insight, awareness? Again, expertise. And if we are, are we willing to accept that there may be things I don't know, that you know that I don't know, that it would be more useful for me to listen than to speak? And now, how do I guide two people, or three people, or 20 people who I'm working with who need to be in a position where they can allow themselves to hear. Well, I'm going to make this argument. If I can get you to recognize, if I can allow you to recognize that I, I get you're here, I get you're in the room, and I must acknowledge you as a person being in the room, as a presence relative to my presence, and that as I speak to you, I'm watching the room. I can't help but see you. I can't help but see your movement. I can't help but hear the wiggling and the giggling, right? And therefore, I respond to it. I have no choice but to do these things. This is what it is to be human in the presence of other humans. So, if, if I can let you know that that's true, that even though I may, be, it may seem to you in a moment that I'm speaking over you or at you, that I'm really speaking with you, something begins to change. If you know when it's important, if you know that at that moment that th something has to be different, you will have the room, the space, to make yourself more present, to step into the conversation and be heard. And you know that when you have something of relevance and importance to share, it's heard, truly heard, listened to. What I've found is that people will allow themselves to hear. They won't feel the need to speak, to be seen, because they're already seen. And this is a problem. This is a challenge. It's a challenge because so many of our leaders don't see. They don't hear. They only show up and speak. You get it? And, and the real challenge, if you really want to get what I'm offering you about this idea of this resonance, is... It's the, the ability, the magic, if you want to call it that, of hearing what's unsaid. It's the profundity in the silence. I know when my daughter doesn't speak to me <coughs> that I have more to hear than when she is speaking. It's then that I have to make an incredible effort to diminish myself enough so she can be present, so she can show up, to let her know it's important for me to hear what she must say, as much as it's in, as important for her to say what I must hear. So are you capable of that? Are you capable? I'm challenging you. It's my intention. So if you feel a little imposed on, good for you. Can you hear what's not spoken? Can you hear what's not being said? Do you recognize when you have the ability to ramble on, to blather forth, without interruption, without challenge, without provocation, that you're probably not hearing what's not being said? People are trying desperately to communicate with you. Are you willing to listen? Because in those spaces, in those silent spaces, that's where the resonance emerges. 
Remember, it's between the two notes. It's not what I possess. I can't hold, I cannot possess the resonance. I have a limited amount of being resonant together with Yespa if, in fact, I want to hold all the tone. Does that make sense? I have to allow him to bring tone for that third to emerge. And what we're looking for here is we're looking for the ability for the third to be present. I talk about a friend of mine who does a particular kind of mentoring and coaching, and I've worked with him for many, many, many years. He was originally a student of mine and has gone on to be a master in his own right in many ways of the art that he brings to the world. And he works mostly with young adults, teenagers, and he presents what he does as being the third voice. Since there's primarily two voices that children have, but they will always have a third voice. And the two voices they will have is initially their caregivers, their parents, the people who are surrounding them, who provide them with the initial sense of what's true in the world, who they are, what they are, what's right, what's wrong, how they should be or not be, all of that input that we bring to the youth that we're engaged with, right? Whether we're the parent or the uncle, you know, whatever it might be. A second voice is the external world. Teachers, coaches, people that they interact with that are authority figures, that they represent, that they respect, and who represent, again, a second idea of how the world is, what's true, what's not true, what's right, what's wrong, how they should be, how they shouldn't be, right? And the third voice that they're yearning for to mediate, to make sense of these two other voices, is always going to be present. Now, that third voice, the worst third voice they could have, let's argue, is the one that's in their own head, trying to make sense of the conflict they experience when these two voices don't share a common point or a common opinion. Because there is no ability to reconcile that from the inside out. We need external data. We need to be able to, to perceive the world out here and to have a multiplicity of opinion, a multiplicity of insight, observation, awareness, experiences. So what's the typical third voice that shows up for a child? Peers, colleagues, friends. Now, if you're eight years old, maybe I'm an elitist, you know, uh, misogynist uh, intellectual or something here, but I'm not quite convinced I want an eight-year-old to be giving my eight-year-old an opinion about how to reconcile what's going on that they're getting about input from me and their teacher. <sighs> Just not so comfortable there. So who becomes that third voice? Well, in the case of my friend, what he's saying is that, in essence, that's what I do. That's what I bring to the clients I work with. These children he works with, whether they're 12 or whether they're 22, and they're not necessarily children, obviously, at 22, young adults at 22, it, they're, they're in conflict in some way. That's why they're engaging with him. They're struggling at some level to make sense of the world, typically. Where do I fit? What's my place? Who am I? What's my identity? How should I align myself with whom, with what? Who will I be and become? You get it? And he steps in and provides this kind of space for them to explore these questions with a particular skill set that allows them to notice <coughs> what's going on from these other multiple inputs and sources that are coming in. How do I remain myself and be with others? This is the fundamental question. And again, I go back to my group. I'm leading my group. How do I let these people be themselves? How do I let each of these individuals that I'm surrounded by, who I've brought together because I need or want their expertise, their opinion, their input, and simultaneously bring them together as a single thing, as a single idea that we're going to bring forth to the world, and let them be themselves? I'm constantly managing these two diametrically opposed considerations. So I've given you some of the hints about what I think works. Like you have to be able to listen. You have to be able to see. You have to be able to hear. <coughs> and at some level, eventually, you have to be able to feel what's happening when you're with others. Because in being in the presence of others, even standing here in front of the room, and I've done this many times. It's not my first time at the rodeo, as we say. There's a certain sense of being with you as a group. This group is different from any other group I've ever been with, ever. 
And I said at the beginning that I've done a lot of this work. It's been 30 years. I've been with a lot of organizations. I've seen a lot of different things. But ultimately, it's not so different. There's a phrase that a guy named Werner Earhart used to use when he was doing his trainings in something called EST, and then it became Landmark Forum. And he's gone around the world and trained tens of thousands of people, and his organization has now gone on beyond him and blah, blah, and all that. But he has a great phrase. When he was just transitioning out of the original program he designed called EST and bringing it into what he now calls Landmark Forum, they made a short film. <coughs> and the film was for all these people who were going through this massive personal development transformational training that they were doing. And it was really designed to provoke a deep sense of awareness of one's own self and being committed to what they called, you know, the integrity of your word. Being your word is the phrase they like to use. But this short film's title is I, I, what I want to reference and what I love. It's called, I used to be different, but now I'm the same. <laughs> and so how do I do this thing that I'm saying is so challenging? How do I get into this moment of being sensitive to the idea of what it takes to be present with you and in addition to being present with you to also at the same time being aware of myself and in order to do this I have to recognize at some level we are the same at some level all humans I've ever met want the same <coughs> kinds of things like I said People want to have an opinion, right? Everyone's entitled to their opinion. That's what I keep hearing. I hear people who tell me, but you're not listening. I have a right to speak. <laughs> then they get offended. I mean, deeply, profoundly, powerfully offended when I say, why have you earned it? I have to earn it. I earned it by virtue of leaving the womb. <laughs> that was it. That was my magnificent accomplishment that you should honor and respect. I've left the womb. Okay, and the thing is that there's a question here at the heart of this idea. Those of you who are in leadership roles, I, I would love for you, if, if you take one small thing from this conversation I'm having with you, this might be the thing. For those of you who are in roles where you're interacting with others, maybe not in a leadership role, but in a teamwork position or in a supporting role of some kind, I'd like you to take this idea is why do people have such a desire, such a yearning, such a need to have an opinion, to be heard? Because they're not. Because they're not. <coughs> and if you can develop the capacity to hear in the silences, in what's not being spoken, what's being said, they will all of a sudden begin to recognize they're being heard. Because they will hear from you what they in their mind are responding to and thinking. Because you're hearing it before they have to say it. You're already present to the message. Your role as a leader is to do three things as far as I'm concerned if we're talking about these kinds of situations where you've brought people together to accomplish something and you've brought them together, you've asked them to be part of what you're doing or you've been chartered and tasked with allowing them to be part of what you're doing. You didn't necessarily go out and pick them, it doesn't matter. But you're now present to lead this group of two or 10 or 10,000, I don't care what it is. If that's your role, you have three fundamental things that you must do. You must let the people who show up, show up. You must make space for them. Right? How do you do that? You have to find out who they are. What do they bring? And then the second thing you have to do is you have to help them to bring it so fully that they begin to bring things that they did not know they possessed before you help them to become present to that which they possessed. Right? So I, I talk about leadership in this way maybe you've heard or read something I've said about this, but I'll share it with you again, and it's this idea that what good leaders do, good leaders allow the people that they lead to become all they're capable of being when they are being led by that leader. So whether it's, again, a small group or a massive undertaking of an organizational leadership role, 
The leader allows the people, if they're good leaders, to bring everything they're capable of bringing to what's present. They allow them to realize the fullness of their potential. A great leader allows them to exceed their potential. How do they do that? How is it possible that if I were a great leader, I would take a group of people, again, whether it's just two or 20 or 200, and bring them together such that when they left this group, they went on with their lives beyond this group, beyond this organization, whatever it is that we're doing together, they recognized, I am now more than I was when I entered that engagement, when I entered that relationship. How can I do that? Well, the only way that I know to do that is to do this third thing. And the third thing that the leader does is he makes the resonant form present. He allows two to become three. He allows the chordal form to emerge. So when the two notes are played together, that third naturally arises. Something happens when Jesper and I interact and we intensively interact, maybe even in conflict with one another's ideas, that we begin to transcend our own ideas. That by in disagreement with one another, in an argument at a formal level, not an emotional level, but an argument of ideas, that he begins to force me to recognize where the gaps, the limits in my own thinking have been. He begins to allow me to see what I could not see by myself. He becomes that third voice for me that reconciles the many voices in my head that I brought to the world. You have to remember, I stand in front of you. You're not just hearing me. You think you're hearing me. But you're not just hearing me. You're hearing a woman who passed away at 103 by the name of Santa Manasia Reggio, my grandmother, on my father's side. You're hearing Anita Maria Di Giorini, my grandmother on my mother's side. My grandfather, Giuseppe Pietro Reggio, my father's father. Never met my, father, my mother's father. But I'm sure that in her voice I've heard his. And in my uncle Nicola and Pasquale, his children. My Aunt Philomena Michelina, how's that for a name? <laughs> my brother, Louis. <laughs> my first wife, Kim. My second wife, late wife, Nancy. My current partner, Laura. My children, Michaela, Jason. You hear their voices, don't you get it? How could you not? How could I not bring them into the room with me? Roy Frazier, one of the guys I learned with. Henry Vano, who I've worked with. <laughs> for hundreds, maybe thousands of hours now. Their voices are present in front of you now. This is not just my voice. <clears throat> because all of those voices have given rise to the voice you now hear, the voice you're listening to. And the thing, of course, is whether you know it or not, whether you like it or not, your voice is in there too now because you're hearing it in your head and you're mixing your voice into mine becoming part of what's going on in there. But it's not what I'm saying that you're hearing. It's what you're hearing that I'm saying. And how do you get there? Well, how many voices are in there for you? Who do you know about who's rattling around back there, so to speak? Right? And of course, it's not like there's a multitude. You know, One of my favorite authors of all time is a guy named Frank Herbert. My favorite book of all time, Dune. And he wrote about the, the Bene Gesserit. These were the witch women who were planning the, the perfect breeding of the perfect person who would bring forth the new you know, embodiment of humanity. And one of the things they have the ability to do is they can pass to another the accumulated life experience they possess at the time of their death. So this Bene Gesserit basic priestess, you could call her, passes her wisdom to the next youngest, to the next, to the next, to the next. And so by the time we get to the book, this has been going on for hundreds of generations, and these women have the ability to go into and hear the voices of their ancestors. I'm not talking about that. That would be a little weird. <laughs> what I'm talking about instead is that it becomes a singularity. It becomes a single voice that we possess that comes forth from us, and this becomes the signature of who we are. So even though I stand before you 
with a multitude of voices that you're hearing, the voice you hear for you is singular. The one I experience for myself is singular. I have to step back from it, stand a short distance from my body, so to speak, to recognize all of these other influences that I bring forth and to be a little bit discerning as well. Because some of it was great. Some of it was really useful information. Not all of it. But because I have so many of them, I can check them against one another. And I can figure out between the two, the space that emerges between the two, where some semblance of value, some semblance of truth exists for me. And in my best moments, I can share that with my daughter or my son or with you in my best moments. But in order to do that, I have to stand a little bit apart from identifying completely with what's coming out. I have to let it be separate from me and not think I own it or possess it or it's just mine. <coughs> right? So I'm going to kind of move to an ending here of sorts, a conclusion, because one of the other voices that I have in my head is a guy named Buckminster Fuller, brilliant scientist, engineer, inventor. And Buckminster Fuller, at the end of his life, he was in his 80s, he used to give this wonderful speech. He was going around to colleges at the time and speaking to these colleges. And he would say something to this effect. He would say, you know, I'm in my 80s now, and I always wonder something. I'm an engineer, I'm an inventor, and I'm a mathematician at some level, and so I like to run the numbers. And he would give this number, and I don't remember the numbers, so I'm not going to make believe I do, but I'll give you numbers just to fill in the gaps. They're, they're not in any way supposed to be correct. But he would make some comment, like, in my lifetime I've breathed 10 tons of oxygen. I've eaten 115 tons of food. And he'd go through these numbers, and he'd go, but here I stand, and I don't feel that heavy. <laughs> he goes, where did it all go? He goes, in fact, I think about this, and I think, you know, this is me, right? But if something happened, if some tragedy for me personally occurred where I lost my right arm or my left leg, would I feel like any less of me is here? And I think not. I get my hair cut when I had hair. And there's no less of me present after that. So all these things I think of as being me seem not to matter so much when I go to the essence of who it is I think I am and who it is I think is in front of you speaking with you. And then I begin to go a little bit deeper, and this is now Joseph speaking, not Buckminster. And I say, wow, it seems to me that those same things are true of the ideas and thoughts I've had. I must have had in my life 10,000 <coughs> times 10,000 times 10,000 thoughts run through the small wetware in my head. And yet, I remember very few of those. Really a tiny little number of the ones that have been up there. And yet I don't feel like there's anything missing from what's up there. It feels like it's all complete and present. So Buckminster Fuller would come to the end of this thing and he'd do his little thing and he'd go, so, and he'd look at his watch and say, you know, we're not really done, but time has run out. So thank you very much. <laughs>